All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Berwick Planning Board meeting. This is uh, a meeting, a regular meeting for Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. If we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> What'd she say? Did it hold on? Something went down, maybe. We're back on. We're back. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Frank, David, Mike, Jen? Yep. Yes. Okay. Introduction of board members. In the in the um, town hall tonight, we have Jerry here. He's our alternative member. We've got Frank. He's our regular member. We've got Dave. And we've also got Mike. So we have a full board here tonight. We've also got our code enforcement officer, Jennifer, and we've got our uh, town planner, uh, James Bellissimo here. Moving on to public comment. Public comments open to any resident or property owner in the town of Berwick to talk about anything that relates to the planning board. Please feel free to come forward and, and speak. Okay, Allison Graybill, a uh, resident at 10 in Berwick. And I read the packet for tonight in regards to the land use ordinance. And I noticed that something that was proposed for the public hearing and for the I 16th meeting wasn't included in tonight's packet. So I didn't know if that was intentional or um, if it was an oversight, but I wanted to bring it to people's attention because I really am strongly in support of adding this and just ask the board to consider that. So what this is in relation to is the 8.25.3 location. And so the old ordinance read marijuana establishments are allowed in, in the R3 zone only on properties which have frontage on Route 9 or Route 4. But what was being proposed in the July meeting was that the RC1 zone be added to that so that um, marijuana establishments could only be located along Route 4 or Route 9 in the RCI and R3 zone. So I don't know if this is a back and forth, but I, I'm hoping the board will put that back in, especially in light of what happened at uh, 11 Pond Road. I, I think it's a good recommendation. James, you got that? Yep. yep. All right, thank you, Mrs. Graybill. I'm not sure if that was an oversight or if it was included for the, the thing that's in January, but I'll double check. It might be an oversight, but it should be on there. Okay, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Anybody in the uh, waiting room for public comment? Yep, I have uh, Mr. Emery here, who's a, a borough property owner, and um, Zach Holt. Um, and if you don't mind, they can discuss. Uh, they have a warehouse off Blackberry Hill Road. Um, and as of right now, the, the type of use that they'd like to do is not allowed. Um, and I think it's, an, it's a good discussion to have whether we should look at amending our ordinance to allow these types of commercial uses in that zone. All right, so it's Glenn and Zach. Yes. Zach? Correct, yeah. Okay, so Glenn, could you please state your address or your name and address for the record and then Zach after you? Okay, Glenn Emery. Um, the property we're discussing is 175 Blackberry Hill Road, and I reside at 187 Blackberry Hill Road. Zachariah Holt. I, uh, my name is Zachariah Holt. I reside at 1 Hales Road in Cape Natick, Maine. All right, Glenn, go yep. ahead. Uh, well, I currently own what's in a current use commercial property. Um, we're grandfathered back into the 60s, uh, well before any zoning was in place. And I'm in the process of getting ready to retire and would like to find some way to make some income out of those buildings. Um, I've been warehousing there since 1983. And uh, so, I mean, it is in current use. And 
while Zach is looking to rent a part of the property um, to do some warehousing. Granted, it's on a different scale, but to be honest, it would be a lot less uh, traffic for what he's trying to do uh, as opposed to what I was doing uh, for the last 38 years. Where exactly is, is your property on Blackberry? Because I'm trying to like visualize this. Um, I'm well, I'm a mile and a half in from Route 236, and it's um, I don't know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Blackberry Hill Farm. Yeah. Okay, it's directly across the street from that. That was my grandparents' property. Our farm was on the other side, and this these buildings were built as a retail farm equipment dealership originally back in the 60s, uh, right beside the farm. Okay, and what are you asking for again? Um, Zach is just looking to do some warehousing and storage in part of one of my buildings. Uh, uh, yeah, which it's not allowed. Um, I think warehousing and storage in the historical sense, back when the zoning was put in, I think you imagine it being heavy trucks, which is part of the why there's a lot of little language that I've been putting in to, that would accommodate this type of use. And this is just a proposal, just total draft, just to get this discussion going for the board. Um, and I, I, if it's okay with the chair, um, have Zach discuss it a little bit, because I think what we could be looking at is creating this new definition, an allowance for kind of a low impact, kind of like we have a low impact manufacturing. It's, it's a definitely a different scale from what, I mean, what's not allowed there. All right, so Zach, we'll turn it over to you if you can unmute him. Um, what are you looking to put in there? So the type of business that I currently operate is a pharmaceutical drug discovery business. We sell uh, compounds for screening purposes into companies such as Pfizer, Moderna, um, large pharmaceutical companies. So what these are is these are small pack sizes of one gram uh, units, which pharmaceutical companies use for further testing. Um, the uh, logistics of the, the site is uh, quite basic in the sense that there's potentially one delivery a day uh, coming in, one outbound delivery every day, uh, which is FedEx and, and UPS. As it starts small, you know, typically we, we drive to UPS and FedEx, but once we scale these, they, they tend to have a, a UPS and, and FedEx delivery for us um, or a truck that just drops off. They tend to be small sizes and employees, uh, less than less than five employees. Um, the amount of compounds I currently house out in San Diego, California, 17,000 compounds. These are non-hazardous, non-regulated. These are not flammable. These are not corrosive. Um, they're basically pharmaceutical salts for drug discovery. And the logistics company that we've created is a company that does fulfillment and distribution for pharmaceutical companies in their screening libraries. So they basically let us hold on to their inventory. They tell us when they want that inventory, we package it up and ship it to them via FedEx and UPS. That's probably the 35,000 foot view. Um, happy to provide whatever other details you need. Okay, uh, Mr. Emery, can you please keep in touch with uh, James here in the planning office? And we'd like to, you know, maybe walk around the property, talk a little bit more about this, but we're not going to be acting on any of this this evening. Okay. Yeah, this is something that we have to, I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for the board, but, you know, if anybody else wants to jump in there, this is something that was thrown at us last minute. Um, there's a lot of variables that come out here with this. Um, if anybody wants to jump in here and, you know, either, you know, disagree with me, that's fine. Or, you know, I just think that there's, there's a reason that Blackberry Hill Road is, is meant for that kind of zoning. It's, it's farmland. It's not route four. It's not route nine. So this is something that we could look into, you know, next month. Mm -hmm. 
No. What uh, Zach, Frank, what, what Zach Frank, is trying to do is a lot lower impact than what I've been doing for the last 38 years. Like I said, my work involved tractor trailer trucks and flatbeds and all kinds of traffic. Uh, what yeah, he's which talking is, about. Which is, yeah. you know, which is, you know, part of farming too. Um, but, you know, we're in a public comment session and I'm glad mm -hmm. that you guys came in here and you're on the radar for the planning board right now. Please keep in touch with James. Okay. And, Keep talking to James and we'll see if we can work something out and mm -hmm. come out there, look at the property and see what, you know, Zach wants to put out there and see whether or not this is possible. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks guys. Thank All right. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, hey, I thought you were going to ask questions, Dave. You know, I thought about that, Frank, and I, I, I said I, Frank and I was ready. Yeah, I know you were ready and I'll, I'll go to you first next. Um, but you know we're in a public comment session, so we should, probably shouldn't be having like a public hearing at this point. But I just that's fine. Know, I, I, I'll wait until we get into that amendments discussion. We just talk amongst ourselves. Yeah. Yep. 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 I just like to, I just like to like Mr. Emery to be on uh, James's radar, and I know he's going to be talking to him and seeing you know if he can get on here for um, some type of conditional use or. You know some change to the land use ordinance, but at this point, this that that's it. This is public comment. So I would just like to say to Mr. Emery and Mr. Holt that uh, I know what you're talking about, and I have the same concerns. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Anybody else for public comment in the I waiting guess. room? Nope. Okay. Seeing nobody else come forward in the waiting rooms virtually or in town hall, we'll. Move on from public comment, moving to approval of minutes for the November 9th, 2020 meeting. Go ahead. A misspelling on page three. It should be exempt instead of accepted. Board and staff discuss marijuana testing facilities and having it be exempt it from the thousand foot radius instead of accept it, I think is what. Being being grammatic, grammatically correct. Yeah, I believe is what we. Did you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that? Frank, Dave, yes. Mike? Yeah, I heard yes. it. Okay. I can hear. Actually, your minutes were wrong, James. It's November 19th, 2020. It said November 9th. Ooh. Anybody else? Frank? I'm good. David? I was not actually at that meeting and will not be voting on the minutes. Okay, Michael? That's the same as me as well. I wasn't there last meeting. Okay, Frank, you were there, right? Are you gonna vote tonight? Yeah, I'm gonna vote, yes. Okay, Jerry? Okay. Um, so we're looking for a motion to approve the minutes for the November 19th, 2020 meeting as amended. I'll make a motion. We have a motion from Jerry. Do we have a second? I will second that. Seconded by Frank. Further discussion? All in favor? Jerry? Yes. Frank? Yes. And I vote yes. That's three nothing. Okay. All right. Next is the June 2021 land use ordinance amendments. And we're diving right into these right now. We have plenty of time. Plenty of time. And we do not have to act on this tonight. No, no, sir. Okay. All right, so um, I already told Frank that he's first up because I, you know, unfortunately called on him first before preemptively. So Frank will go first, but first I'm gonna turn it over to James. Sure, uh, the, the first thing I'll, I'll make a note and, and emphasize, um, we're ahead of the game here for once. Uh, the, the public hearing uh, critical date is, uh, Feb would be February 4th and then, um, Based off the public hearing, we have a couple weeks to make final amendments for February 18th. So everything here, 
Um, it's been pretty, um, you know, winter time can be pretty slower for the planning department. So now's the time to think about long range planning things. Um, so we've had time to um, get some ideas going. And a, a lot of these are, are um, need to have standing with the, the comprehensive plan. Um, I did invite uh, a farmer to speak to the food sovereignty ordinance. Um, and I, I, they're not here. So maybe um, next meeting they can make an appearance. Um, I have a host of, of changes. I have a memo here, but if Frank, if he's ready to go to talk about can you go on your memo? I'll go down my memo. No, I, I just soon follow along, James and Dave, how you have it structured for this evening. If we're going to take yeah. each of those topics individually, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go down the memo as just an, an overview, and then we can go from there. Um, so access to lots, um, Frank and I, we had a discussion and with Jen, um, so nothing's changed from there. Uh, with marijuana, there's a couple changes. Um, Allison brought up a good point about thousand foot setback should apply to the same businesses if they're not on contiguous lots to prevent that leapfrogging that I mean that's a real thing and that's something that could happen. Um, Mike, you tell if after I go through this, um, I, I reached out to Mike about the home occupation standards. Um, one concern is if we're permitting these things, we want to have some handle on people getting permitted and just expanding past of what they are legally allowed to do. And if there's new construction, or at least we know we're limiting them to some footprint. So that's the thought behind that. There's a series of bullet points on um, what Zach and Glenn with this warehousing thing. And these are the type of steps that would be required to allow that type of use. And again, the, the, the thought process behind this, and that's the reason why there's, um, on the memo, there was a, um, a, a chart of the distribution of, of residential to commercial. In our town comprehensive plan, it, it, you know, it says we should have a balance of residential and commercial. That balance has not changed in 30 years because all of these areas are basically residential zones with no commercial uses. So that's just a thing to think about. Um, and to go along with the ordinance change, so to allow warehouses on collector streets, collector streets are defined in the Berwick uh, Comprehensive Plan. And those are your next level streets down from Route 4, Route 9, that had Long Swamp, um, Cranberry Meadow. And uh, part of the amendment you'll see is not allowing heavy trucks. Um, one last thing on that is if Zach was living at that property, he very well would have likely be approved for a home occupation business because that's, that's how low of a impact this use is. But because it's not his primary residence, he doesn't fall under that. So that's on that piece. Um, impact fees. So we're trying to, with fees, with our town fees and with um, the sewer fees, we're always trying to evaluate where we're at to make sure that our fees make sense, especially in context with the downtown development. Uh, one thing to think about, uh, we have open space impact fees. We're also mandating open space downtown. It's kind of a double hit. Uh, another piece of that impact fee um, amendment is um, having provisions in there if the developer uh, voluntarily um, says, hey, we're going to build this park, they can then go to the select board and they can say, hey, we put in $25,000. This is where your impact fees were going anyways. Uh, that language came directly from, uh, a lot of it was borrowed from Portland, Maine. They have those provisions in their impact fees. And um, the other ones were pretty, pretty minor, the ones that Nicole suggested as she went through. So person being deleted, agriculture, including any well, well, and then uh, 8.6 apartments, just striking um, the, the, the specific screen requirements, and then just getting rid of the 50 foot buffer. 
um, because the buffer would be taken up through subdivision anyways. So those, that's, um, that's, that's my rundown. And um, I see Liz is in the waiting room for the food stop entry. If you want to go to that. Okay. That's actually first on some of our amendments. So um, hello, Liz, can you hear us? Liz, can you hear us? Oh, your mic's on mute. Hi. Hi, Liz. Liz, what's your address? Do you own any property in Berwick? I do, uh, 152 Little River Road. Okay, very good. All right, go ahead. Can you talk about some of these, uh, you know, James wanted you to come on here and talk a little bit about this food sovereignty. Uh, food sovereignty, yeah, and I apologize for being, um, it sounds like I'm a, a little late to the party here. I thought the meeting started at seven. <laughs> so excuse me for being uh, slightly late. We have a, another um, guest joining us too, uh, Jordan Pike of Two Toad Farm. He should be in within the next five minutes or so. Um, but I can at least start you off uh, and let you know what it is. Um, food sovereignty uh, started in Maine back in the early 1990s. And basically um, what it does is it, it enables people who are interested in starting up um, from small farms to uh, maybe uh, baking or food processing, um, allows them to start up at home and um, negates the need to have the federal and state regulations that come along with uh, being able to sell the food products that you make or that come right from your farm. Um, so it's a, a way for people to legitimize and beta test their products with friends and family in the community, um, without having a lot of the startup costs that are involved, such as getting a commercial kitchen or some of the other large equipment that's needed on farms and things to sell milk and things, things of that nature. Does okay. that answer your question? Yep, James, you want to start off with um, our amendments, starting off with one? Sure, uh, yeah, so the, the food sovereignty ordinance, the way that we have it, as of now, I just have um, in the packet is just the, the, the templates from Sanford, and it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward um, where we would just replace Sanford with Berwick and that, um, I don't see a need to adopt much more, but I would defer to Jordan and Liz to see what, yeah, I think the, the enactment of it is referencing the actual state statute and then embedding that as our own ordinance. Mm -hmm. So we do have, we do have Jordan here. If there's anything that. Yeah, where is Jordan? There he is. Okay. Got to put his mic on. Yeah, you're muted. Yep. Jordan. I don't think he hears us. Sometimes the host has the ability to unmute. Unmute, here we go. Here we go. Hi, Jordan. Hi, yeah, this is, sorry folks, this is my first Zoom meeting ever. So you guys are breaking me in, so. You're lucky, <laughs> you're very lucky. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're gonna, I'm gonna have to come up the learning curve a bit with you folks. Um, one of the things that um, I would encourage everybody to do um, is look at the Maine Food Sovereignty Act, LD 795, because there's a lot of language there that's very pertinent to food sovereignty in Maine and how Maine and Maine's legislature views food sovereignty and the inherent rights of individuals and municipalities. But also to look at the food sovereignty template uh, the template ordinance known as LUFESCO, the Local Foods and Community Self-Governance Ordinance. 
that uh, is the template uh, that all of the, I think we're up to 75 municipalities in the state of Maine now that have passed some form of LaFesco um, that has started with. Um, so it's pretty important to uh, use those as a starting point. I have read Sanford's ordinance. Um, Sanford's ordinance, is referred to uh, for all of the folks um, who are um, part of initiating and uh, start, you know, starting and working hard on the Food Sovereignty Ordinance as well as getting the Food Sovereignty Act passed. They think of Sanford's ordinance as very, as very lackluster. It's not a good starting point overall. Um, it really doesn't capture all of what food sovereignty aims to be. Um, so I think it's really important to, to start with the template that is available to the municipalities and then pare it down from there. I know that's what we did in Lebanon. Um, the Lebanon ordinance is also not uh, 100%. I, I wish it had more in it, um, but the Lebanon ordinance is a pretty, bulletproof ordinance from a legal standpoint and the town of Lebanon worked really closely with the Maine Municipal Association um, as well as myself and my partner Mary Beth at Two Toad Farm um, in order to craft it so that it really met the needs of the consumers who have, will and should have the right to choose their food and the producers that would be producing food. Okay Frank questions. Uh, yeah, I uh, I had an opportunity to talk to James a little bit about this after our last meeting. And when I looked at the original one in our packet, which was the Sanford one, I said, that's very simple, very straightforward. I mean, the people that want to do this understand it. And all I wanted to know is where was it coming from? Were we inventing this or were we finding that it was being put together in other communities, this, that, and the other? When I saw the second draft of it, which by then we had changed Sanford to Berwick, but we added four more pages. I will tell you, I read all five pages of that, but I would have stopped after the first page and added who's responsible for enforcing it as the closing paragraph. I think that, I mean, Jordan has done a lot of work. I know this is his forte and he's right on, on the cusp of everything that we're trying to do from a sustainability and this, that, and the other. But I don't think people in Berwick are gonna read that literature, all four pages of the legalese and whatever else. Strictly by reference of LD, and I'm glad you brought it up, Jay, uh, Jordan, LD 795 and the template and the La Fresco and this, that, and the other. We just have that in our files as backup, but I wouldn't want to see all of that language put in our ordinance where we have been trying to spend a lot of time streamlining our ordinance to bring it in line to where it is pretty simple and straightforward. I mean, right. if, if, right. if Lebanon has done due diligence on that, I'd like to look at Lebanon's. I mean, if, Jay, if uh, James could get a hold of that, work with Jordan and Jen, um, find out what that is. And that could be a simple global change levered into Berwick. I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's got the information in there that you think makes it very credible and meaning and um, people will understand why we're doing it. And that's all I had on that. Oh, the other thing is, is that, um, am I under the, you know, body language, Dave, I can see you. Oh, you can't see <laughs> and Jerry, I, I see that too, come on. Um, Am I under the impression that if you we set yourself today, up, Frank, what's that? <laughs> you set yourself up. All right. If, if we end up with something like a food hub where people mm -hmm. can come in and do cooking and this, that, and the other, I'm assuming that is all exempt from any of this stuff and that that must come out under commercial kitchens and federal. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, okay. I would, I, okay. I would, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Yeah. Okay. I am too. I just want yeah. to make sure I understand this is the, the back kitchen grandma's recipe kind of a thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, David? 
I actually, you know, the same with Frank. I quickly read through it. Let's just keep it as simple as possible, as simple yeah. to understand, and as simple to enforce. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Michael? I'm in agreement with both. Okay. Jerry? Same. Yeah, keep same here. Um, can you reach out or Jennifer reach out to maybe Lebanon and kind of see what they're doing as well, but just keep it simple. Like Frank said, this does not open up like kitchens and things yeah. like outdoor kitchens and things like that. This is just very simple. So, um, all right. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you, Liz, for coming on tonight and sharing with us. You guys yeah. started off in the right direction, started us off in the right direction. Dave, one question just to them because they they live this stuff. Does this, if a town has an ordinance such as this, I asked James the other day when I was talking with him, if a town has this kind of an ordinance, does it make it available for us to qualify for any kinds of funding? Say for assistance for farmers markets or this along, I mean, maybe, maybe that's a question that this doesn't apply to, but um, I was just wondering if there was a, a definite distinct benefit to having this in our ordinance that allows us to secure maybe some funding and moving some of our initiatives and sustainability forward. Yeah, I think that's, good, that's a good point, Frank. I can maybe speak a little bit to that. This is Jordan. Um, there's nothing that I know of specifically um, that would qualify kind of like, you know, in the main state within the state, if you have a comprehensive plan, then you qualify for certain assistance. There's, there's no automatic qualification, but what it does do is make, you know, the town more attractive to farmers, farming businesses, homesteaders, people who have an interest in maybe starting a small local business and starting very small, and then being able to build a very small customer base kind of a earn while you learn type of scenario so that when somebody is ready to maybe jump in with both feet and, and, and make that investment and build their commercial kitchen and ramp up and, and start a distribution, they already have a certain financial stability uh, behind them. And that's a really important part of food sovereignty. Um, one more thing that I would like to, to bring up is some folks have talked a number of times about uh, using the word enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. It's very, a food sovereignty ordinance is very different in that it allow, it's, it's expressly allowing people to do something as opposed to preventing people from doing things. Most ordinances prevent you from doing things and set limitations. Food sovereignty is, is pretty much the exact opposite. So, Food sovereignty is not something that is enforced. Everything that is already in place, our food uh, regulatory system, state and federal, is already in place. So state and feds are already enforcing all of that. What food sovereignty does is puts the onus of responsibility on the individual and the individual producers to, so that there is no particular enforcement necessary on a municipal level, the enforcement already exists in state and federal. So that really takes a lot of effort away from the municipality. And we know what effort in municipality means, it means money. So it, it, it does not cost money um, because there really is no enforcement, if that makes sense. But if it's in our land use ordinance, uh, Jordan, the enforcing officer for that is our code officer. So, I mean, the, why well, had the question, say somebody goes out and picks wild mushrooms, cans them up and sells them and everybody comes down with some exotic disease, botulism mm -hmm. or whatever. Is the town on the hook for any of that? It's in our ordinance. And how, no. do, how do we exempt the town from being subject to a liability that we have nothing to, to that we can control in a, someone's back kitchen? Right, yeah, it has absolutely zero effect on liability. Anybody who is producing food and selling it is still 100% liable as they are if they have a, a piece of paper and they're doing it on a huge scale versus a small scale. Um, and then I would refer you back to the 
the original Lufesco template, which has been worked on by lots of lawyers and legislators and has evolved over the years. So I think it's on its fourth revision now. Um, and there is a lot of language in there that very expressly exempts towns from liability. And it, so it, it, it's not something that a town is on the hook for. And that was one of the things Lebanon was very, very worried about. Mm -hmm. So the language in Lebanon's ordinance is very clear. And to get that ordinance copy, it is very easy to find right on the Lebanon uh, town website. I would just want to make sure that our town attorney looks at this thing and that if there's a footnote in there or a caveat that states exactly what Jordan just said about the town is exempt from any exposure, this, that, and the other, and it's all on the, I want to make sure if we're going to put anything in there and it takes up a yep. half a page, it's that yep. footnote. Yep, we will. Right. All right, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Liz. I was just going to add a, a little tat, you know, to towards the end of this. Like, yeah, real whole, quick. Yep, yeah, the whole point in food sovereignty is to really it it sort of almost brings us back to the way things were originally in the United States when we became the United States of America, yeah. when we are supporting our community, its neighbors taking care of neighbors. Um, and so it's really, you know, me as a consumer, I have a responsibility of knowing what I'm buying and who I'm buying it from. And so um, it's, it's about knowing your neighbor, knowing your farmer and using your good judgment as to whether or not you're going to you make that purchase or consume yeah. that food. And so that's on me. That's my liability and the person that is producing the food. So the town is in no way uh, responsible. If well, you're not, you're not a lawyer. You know what? I know you guys at Two Toad Farms and I like you guys a lot and I bought from you guys before, but you know, there is legalese and that's why we're doing this right now. So I un totally understand Liz what you're saying. And I totally agree with that, but we just have to make sure that this ordinance is nailed down tight. So, um, so there is no liability because, you know, that's the world that we live in. So unfortunately, but, um, you know, I appreciate that. Um, anything else, James, on this? That's it for, for now. I think that's okay. enough to work with. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your night to come on here. And uh, we'll probably have you back again. How did the, uh, er how'd the Eric Knowlton farmer's market go last Sunday? It, it oh, went wow. really well. It went really well. We okay. were really pleased with the the turnout. Um, and we're looking forward to our next market, which will be there again outdoors on the 13th. And Frank, I hope I see you at that one. <laughs> well, we were tied up with something else. But the, the, the idea is I take this as a public service announcement opportunity when I'm on the planning board. I want the public to hear some of this stuff. So that's why I asked the question. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, have, a, have a great night and James reach out. We'll do. Yep, James number two. Um, we've already gone through um, that in pretty good detail. Um, the defin definition of frontage, it's a long definition that includes the definition of legal access, which um, goes on to conflict with 7.21. Really, this is not effectively changing anything significant. The only thing that's really adding is that it's clarifying when it says drainage ditches and culverts shall be installed at all appropriate points. It doesn't say what, like, it, it doesn't say how in the ordinance. So it's, it's, it's um, further explained, and this is new language, as determined by the town of Berwick or a third party engineer hired by the town at the applicant's expense. And also this other, this last sentence, access to lots, this, this refers to um, a specific example is Rhythm, Rhythm Road being a dirt road. Mm -hmm. um, we have standards, uh, dwelling unit standards that only apply to private roads. Um, so this would prevent, I mean, it's unlimited development on our dirt, dirt roads. That's pretty much how it stands right now. Um, are there any, any qu questions on, on that number two? So the, to start out, the definition of frontage, 
um, again, it's just, it just simplifies. Um, it really can be summed up by one sentence. It's actually, and then, yeah. And then uh, number three is, is number three is really just taking paragraphs and putting it into a table. It's making it accessible to the, um, the general Berwick citizen. And that's really part of our, of our work is, is making our, our ordinance more accessible to the public. So that's it for number three. Um, number four and five are that marijuana. Um, we covered the, the setback and then marijuana testing facilities being exempted, exempted is the word. And my, Mike, um, I'll ask you how you think about, so the floor area for home, home occupation um, for the entire use being limited to 2,000 square feet in the cultivation area being limited to 500 square feet? Um, I think it's too small. Um, I honestly think that a cultivation area, if you have a licensing for 500 square feet of flowering, you should be able to utilize that. Um, if maybe, it's hard to, it, for cultivating, I can understand setting a, a limit of floor space to use, but if you're, let's say you have an old barn, a horse barn or something that you wanna convert into a grow room, what, what's to say you can't use the whole thing for a dry room, for a processing room, for a bedroom, for moms, for clones? There's a lot of different things that, you know, 2000 square feet might seem like a lot, but when you're really growing, it's not, um, especially like 500 square feet. If this was like per caregiver, I, I could see maybe the 2000 square feet with the limited of a thousand square feet of cultivation. Cause that way that covers your moms, that covers your clones, your propagation, your veg. So if you have backups, um, which all of that is, is state approved. So, I mean, at that point it's, yeah, That's, I think if it just if we just go with a, it just get rid of the entire use limit, and then just having something for Jen and I, when we look yeah. at a floor plan, yeah. um, just to be able to have something that 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 limits yeah. it, so we can start yeah. feeling comfortable going. We understand the scale. I, of I think the the limiting factor would be the flowering rooms, um, which would be the five hundred square foot per, per caregiver. So let's say like. An example is if a uh, husband and wife wanted to be caregivers together and have they, they each have their own licensing, they should each have their 500 square feet of flowering and canopy if they pay for that license. You know, the state, you can have different size licenses. So it's like if you wanted to have less, then you, you would be using less, but you're paying more for that license as well. So even if there was a town permit for it, then they could then charge more. I just think th these are big, these are big rooms. I mean, 2,000 not, not square really. feet. It, it, it's not. If you want to talk about scale. It's, this my, is, 40, it's this my 40 is, by 60 foot first floor in my barn. That's tiny. That's really tiny. But yeah, with, isn't this for caregivers? This, I mean, you're talking about a small business um, at a home. So are you going to cap a small business at making thirty five to $50,000? Yes. $50, yes. Because it's not down on Route Four. But if there's no if there's no traffic, they're totally entitled to do it on their that's own. That's not property. the point of it, Michael. That's yes, not it is. The point of it. No, is the, the whole idea isn't to have twenty nine of these things or four hundred of these things willy nilly all down. It, it, if they if they're licensed caregivers through the state, they should. You should be every anywhere. Okay. Why are, why are you trying to say that they shouldn't be? And I ask if, if it's li if, a house, if it's licensed, who licensed right. them? The state. Okay, and how do we keep an inventory of those licenses? That was well, one of my questions it. way back when we started talking about this marijuana yeah. stuff. But the state. We have state no. We have no mechanism to license people. Yeah, but why? 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 I get if people in my neighborhood that are closing their garages. Okay, yeah. they're taking their garage doors off and they're closing them in. Yeah. I don't want that in my neighborhood, or anybody should have that yeah, in the neighborhood. But as an individual, why do you have some 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 say over whatever anyone does to their house? Because like, it's marijuana. That's the well, only reason. 
It doesn't make it's a difference. A law no. You have to think it's about not it. It's recognized by the federal government. government. It's 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 taking something that is so specialized and fairly new, and now trying to make it fit in every municipality in the state of Maine or whatever other state, 17 of them that have approved it. Well, it it's does fit. going too far. It's one of the I, would stick it in a, I would stick it in a 12 by eight shed. That's not that you can't make a living off of that. It's not the point to make a living. Is it? Yes, it is. If people are doing this, they're doing it for a profession. I mean, why, why would they not do it? Then I want to know about the home occupation, the, the an issuance of certificate of occupancy and all of that stuff before I go down that road. Yeah, that's too much. You're, you're trying. You're overstepping. That's just my opinion. You're you're, you're overstepping. I mean, if someone was having an at-home business, you want to know exactly what they have, when they have it. You want approval from this. I mean, that just seems too. That's too much. Yeah. Okay. We have their state restrictions, and we should follow it. I mean, I, mean it's, I, I was in college in the '60s, guys. All right, just so that you know. I'm going to turn it over to Jerry. He wanted to say something earlier. I think the state law governs by only one caregiver per residence. So how can you have more than one in a residence? You can have more as long as they both, as long as everyone is a legal resident of that house, you can have multiple caregivers operating. The only thing is, is to do that, you need to have separate areas of flowering and growing and everything has to be separate. We, That's we, the we consider multiple caregivers as a production facility. Yes. Locally. At that level, especially when it's less than a thousand feet from another production yeah. facility. Yeah. Well, that was a spirited discussion. I think um, we can let the dust settle on that. And I think we can keep going. We can, yeah, we can go on to. Uh... Can I just, uh, can I just ask one more question? Cause I was the one that raised the marijuana testing when the guy from three G's was in. Yep. And, we, and we've, we've added some verbiage in there, but Oops. I'm, I'm a big one to go to the land use table, look at the, the district, and look at the line item. Frank, I know we're going out with that. That has been pigeonholed. Are we going to add that into the table? It already has. You must be looking at an old ordinance version. Uh, all I got was what I got. The, I mean, okay. All I want is to make sure that there's a right. box on there that's got X's, 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 X's conditional use. I got two two big ones, and the rest are minor. So this is the. Uh, I'll go through the warehouse um, storage and distribution. What this is a total draft. This is a, a thought exercise to think about over the next month or so. What what the way forward to allow what Glenn and Zach were, were asking? You make uh, warehousing, storage, and distribution as a conditional use. And I say in the R two and R three zone, you put an asterisk next to it, which um, that that sends them to the performance standards in 8.27, which that restricts it to collector streets. So it's not on local streets. Uh, the next, next part would be uh, restricting, prohibiting heavy um, commercial vehicles. And that language comes directly from the home occupation standards. You could even further go and limit it to trips per day if we wanted to. Um, and that's, I mean, that's really, um, that's, the, that's the extent of it for that one. Uh, let me just say, I am very adamantly against having any type of wholesale, warehousing, storage, anything in R2, R3. That does not belong out on Blackberry, Cranberry, Diamond Hill, any of those connect, what do you call them? Collector streets. Collector streets, does not belong out there. That's farmland. I, I'm, I'm adamantly against that and I'll vote against the entire land use ordinance amendments because of that. I look at Blackberry Hill Road, I drive down that road every day. I, that, that is not a warehouse road. So I'm against that. That's just me. Yeah, I think it opens up stuff, especially on like Pine Hill Road. We have, we have, we have our CI districts, we've got the CI district, that's what that's for. You know, if we start allowing 18 wheelers down there, uh, picking up, that's, you know. That's what, sorry to interrupt, but that's why the, the definition of heavy truck would prevent 
it prevents the heavy truck. That's farmland, Blackberry Hill Road, Cranberry, Diamond Hill, that's all farmland. We're trying to attract people to farm in this town. That's farmland, that's rural, that's not industrial. It, I would just say, I'll just say one thing and it's, it's becoming residential and that's a whole nother topic. Well, it's, it's becoming residential, but the way that I look at it, I will not support that amendment. That's just my, my standing on that. All right. You got anybody ask? else? Oh yeah, yeah. Can I offer something? I know somebody that spent a lot of effort to try and restore an old historical property. Um, it's in the R1. Um, matter of fact, what they just did was a barn that used to be an old hay barn. And you know what? They can't store hay in it right now. They can't store grain or oats or pallets of wood pellets because it's in the R1 and warehousing is not allowed. Now, they can put four apartment units in it, which I don't think this group wants to do that, but they can't store automobiles that people take off the road in the winter. They can't store boats that people obviously need to put them under a cover if they don't wanna shrink wrap them. As a matter of fact, this same property can't even, because you can't allow low impact industry in this zone, this property can't be turned into a pottery barn or a carpentry shop or anything along that line. It's just going to sit there. So anything that further restricts anything or opens it up elsewhere, I should say, then we ought to be thinking about opening up everywhere. I agree with you, Dave, it's farmland. It should stay, it should stay farmland. I don't support this, but I also know this, this, this other person, people that own this thing, their hands are kind of tied. They don't know what the hell they're going to do with it. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Oh, uh, do mar they can't even do marijuana in there. <laughs> David or Mike? What's that? No, I'm good. I'm good. Jerry? All right. Continue, James, please. I'll just read the modification of impact fees. Uh, required impact fee may be modified in whole or in part by form of vote by the Board of Selectmen if the board finds that one, the developer or property owner who would otherwise be responsible for the payment of the impact fee voluntarily agrees to make improvements for which the impact fee would be collected or an equivalent improvement, improvement approved by the reviewing, reviewing authority or the developer or property owner is required as part of a development approval by the town or a state or federal agency to preserve open space or to make or to pay for improvements for which the impact fee would be collected or an equivalent improvement. Um, I actually, um, I recently made some improvements to the paragraph. I think it re reads kind of confusing. So I can just read how I have it. Um, so it goes B, Credit amounts shall be determined based on the plans, details, and cost estimates for the proposed infrastructure improvements for which the credit is requested. Such plans, details, and cost estimates shall be prepared by a licensed professional engineer and submitted at the time of the site plan, subdivision, or building permit application. The applicant shall pay for any third-party reviews of the plan, details, or cost estimates. Then it specifies, this doesn't apply to subdivision um, requirements of open space. This would require, this would be for uh, site plan. Uh, but if someone was building a subdivision and they wanted to build a park, I think that's something that you're incentivizing someone to create a recreational facility and they are not adding a burden onto a recreational facilities because they're creating something to offset that burden. That impact. Okay. Yep. Are there any questions on fifteen point on that one? You, you're going to ask people in order, Dave. Go I ahead, can, Frank. I can, I can wait and go last. Go ahead, Frank. Um, you said you got this from Portland. Yeah. Right? 
I mean, I can understand why you might do something like this in a highly urban area where there isn't much downtown space readily available and where they offer up the ability to build a small park in a neighborhood on the, on the periphery of the town that might serve four or five neighborhoods. I can understand that, but I don't think it's necessary in Berwick. And the reason I say it is because we haven't proven ourselves that we can even handle the impact fees that we have. I mean, I wouldn't ask the selectmen to negotiate anything at this point, okay, with any developer on doing anything. Okay, we can't even resolve how we're spending the monies now. We are using impact fees for maintenance items, to put up a, a privacy fence, for making connections to a utility or disconnections to utilities because we didn't have enough money in the budget to cap them off in the first place. We are misusing some of these things and I am on record with a selectman and the town manager indicating that we need to do kind of a house cleaning keeping thing on this and now realign this so that we are spending them on truly what impacts are for open space and recreation. So before I would support anything to give the selectmen any more authority, or something I don't think we need in our town, I won't support this one. And I think we need to have a workshop session with the board of selectmen, the planning board, and the code officer who's responsible for collecting these things and truly figure out where we're going. We've been collecting them for four years now. And the only thing we've spent them on have been mispenditures on maintenance items. All right, no, take it, Frank. You know what? And we actually have to have a workshop with them anyway to discuss the um, moratorium on marijuana permits as well, because they put the um, the caveat that we would be back to them every year to discuss. Right. So we need to schedule a workshop with them. Can we do that for February? Yeah. We've got a light schedule through the winter. Perfect time to start getting some yeah, of these let's things do that February. Out. All right. Go ahead, James. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Can, Thanks, I, Frank. can I interrupt? Um, if it's too late in February, I'll be out for a month, just to let everybody know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead, James. Out of my control. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number nine is just striking person. Uh, persons defined earlier in the land use ordinance. I see no reason to define it again. Number 10 is just adding. Rather from a well, Nicole pointed out it should be any well. And then number 11, uh, it, it, it takes away the speci um, specifying the type of screen. It, it says a six foot screen of uh, wooden or masonry. And there's, there's other different types of screens. Um, so that's, it's stricken. And then there's a, a, a 50 foot landscape buffer shall be provided along all property boundaries. Nicole brought up, is that 50 foot wide? Is it 50 foot long? Uh, that actually came from our template ordinance 30 years ago. And I have no idea what the basis is of that. But also for any apartment, that's gonna be taken up through subdivision. So any buffering or screening can be taken care of at that point. Mm -hmm. so we don't need that line. And uh, I just wanna say, um, this was a lot thrown at you guys. Um, definitely pushing the envelope on, on, on changes. So I appreciate the, discussions and, and no but you know what you threw this at uh, I'm, I'm you know James I'll give you a compliment okay. you're very far ahead of the ball here on this and you threw this at us way ahead of time and we have a couple contentious things that we have to work out um, I'd like to talk to the selectmen because we have to anyway because they asked us to come to them about the whole marijuana thing um, but I know that, you know, Frank and, and Mike and, you know, and a couple other people had some issues with some of the other language on here. I think that, you know, we have something on the 16th, which is big. So we shouldn't be talking about this that night. Right. But then, you know, moving in. Yeah. Moving into, um, you know, January, I think that we can definitely, you know, kind of iron these things out. Could you please, you know, work some type of schedule out that we can get with the selectmen in February and have this joint workshop. Absolutely. Yep. And ahead of time, I would like I would like to get a consensus from the board when we go into that meeting, whether or not we think that the requirements that we have, um, kind of capping the whole, you know, different type of marijuana is something that we should stick with going into, you know, 2021, 2022. So we can kind of talk about that as well, but no, good job, James. I think it's good. 
Um, can I just ask a couple of questions on yeah. the apartment building and multifamily development piece? Uh, it sort of concerns me about the outdoor storage area and it not being specific as far as what's hiding containing that. I, I just can see, you know, somebody parking a U-Haul and calling that a, 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 a screen. Right. Yeah, I mean, I you could probably rather maybe just say wooden masonry or um, what's the other word? The, uh, well, if it's storage shed, it's got to go through the uh, it's got to go through Jennifer. It's uh, it's the screen, the um, the trash. That's I mean, true. we can look at the property on, at the corner of School Street, and th that dumpster has been sitting out there for six years like that. There's another property out on Pine Hill that it's the dumpster sitting at the end of the driveway. Right. Both of those. No are screening right. whatsoever. Yeah. Those, are, and just a note, those, Jen and I have been working on uh, that dumpster for a while. We're, it's, <laughs> we can talk about it later, but it's, yeah. Uh, yep. I know what you mean. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to thank whoever muted me when my phone in my office here rang. So thank you, whoever did that. Uh, that that was your wife, Linda, who did that. <laughs> I know she's in the room with you right now. She's like pulling the pulling the strings. Yeah, see that Frank? dance, <laughs> Frank? You see that? No, this is a great conversation. Absolutely great conversation. And I feel really good about being way far in advance on this. Thank you, James. Um, if nobody sees anything else that they want to talk about for these land use ordinance amendments, uh, we can move on to the next portion, which is public comment. Do you have anybody in the waiting room? No. Okay, there's nobody in the audience here. Uh, any informational items? Um, I have one question. So I saw the PD posted, and I know that the Ridland Road Bridge was red listed. I know Diamond Hill is kind of red listed too. That's going to be one of probably the first bridge to be worked on. But when is is Rid? And I saw the post. It said um, until further notice. Is is the town and the state going to be repairing that bridge by next spring? I I think until further notice. I believe. I don't know. I, let me let me it's check. Seasonal. All right. Let me get back to you. I, so I, I wanted. I was going to email Steve and I was going to email Tom. I know that Diamond Hills another red listed bridge, and that gets more traffic than than uh, Ridland Road. But I'm just kind of concerned about that because I know a lot of people use that, especially in the spring and summer, getting down to Hatfields. Well, I think we need to add that also as a an item to talk to the selectmen as well, Dave. Based on the discussion Jennifer and James and I had about what the potential is out there on Ridland Road. And the idea that to go ahead and spend a lot of money on a road that the town doesn't even maintain year round needs, to me, needs to drive a conversation as to what are we going to do with Ridland Road? Are we going to actually bring that up to grade, pave it all the way through and make it a year round road? We need to talk to the stakeholders out there. You got to bring in the large property owners like Tuckahoe Turf. I mean, they may not be harvesting turf for 40 years, but in year 41, they may be wanting to put some kind of a project out there on that on that large vast of land they have. So it really drives a discussion with not only the selectmen and the planning board as to what Ridland Road and Ridland Road Bridge should be, but it also should drive a discussion that we should have with the two or three major stakeholders out there that own umpteen acres of land. And we yeah. ought to get ahead of the curve and look at this thing in a more proactive way so that 10 years out, we have got the right infrastructure to support what might be the right endeavor. They have every right to come in there and put in uh, four acre, uh, you know, 120,000 square foot lots all over that sod farm. They have every right to do that if they decide to close the sod farm down, you know, so need to be ahead of it and have yeah, those dialogue no, I, I, now. Frank, I agree with you too. I am as, you know, for right now, I'm looking at that, you know, a lot of people use that um, access 
I know I do, to get out to that 2.2 acres that the town of Berwick owns, that beach there, to access Hatfields. And that's a huge, you know, a lot of people in this town use that as recreation. And to have to go all the way around, I'm just kind of curious about that. But, you know, you're right. Maybe Tuckahoe someday says we're done. And the same thing with, uh, what is it, Ace Acres, Acer Acres? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it could be the same thing. And how much, how much money the town sinks into that. And I know that that's a private road past there. So um, I just wanted to bring that up. I'll, I'll email Steve and Tom. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious about that. Because like I said, there's two reasons. I know a lot of people use that as recreation in Berwick. And I use that road a lot myself. And to have to go all the way around to K Road, <laughs> it's going to be a long way around to get to Hatfields. But it's, it's, I think it's very important to this town to have that bridge. And I'm just kind of curious. And also to know about Do the Diamond Hill Bridge, because mm -hmm. I know that's, that's red listed too. That's been dropped down to five tons. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about that too. So that's all that I have. Anybody else? Jerry, you got anything for the board? Frank? Yeah, I do. Um... I think what we ought to do, I dropped, Dave, I dropped you and Nicole an email because I just think before snow flies, everybody on the planning board ought to go out to the new police fire safety complex. And yes, walk. Frank, I meant, to, I meant to reply to you and you know, to, to, you know, to talk about Frank's uh, email there. I think that maybe, is there some way that we can get like a workshop ahead of a planning board meeting that we can go out there and just take a tour of that facility? I know they didn't have a grand opening and an open house, but can we go out there and look at it? Yeah. Not from like, we're gonna be out there with a notepad, yeah. you know, and, and jotting notes down, say, you know, you didn't do this, but I think that we deserve to be able to go out there. Absolutely. Because I mean, yeah, we were we we were interested in in that public access through through there. Now's a prime opportunity to look at it because there are a lot of opportunities to make that happen. That area that was supposedly wet, this that and the other, it's bone dry. True, we've come off a drought, but the way they've channelized the flow out there, a lot of it could be well contained within the framework of that channelization and allow opportunities for a pedestrian bridge to go through there over to Sullivan Street yep. and, uh, and a few other things. Can you set that up with Chief Plant? Okay. Sure. Anything else, Frank? Um, yeah, there was something else, but I, I got, you know how I get into detail? I got carried away. Ask All right, well, it'll, it'll come back to me. Answer that thought, Frank. If you think about it, we'll come back to you, David. I'm good, thank you. Michael. <laughs> I'm good. James? Great Falls Construction will be doing their, um, possibly their last um, update session in, in outside of planning board, uh, December 15th. And then they're, um, they're actually going, they're aiming for, and I think they're gonna hit their date. They're, they're putting all their effort into hitting December 10th to submit materials for planning board. And at that point, they'll be available on the town website. And they're going to be in for a sketch level for their site plan uh, December 17th. Okay, Jennifer. Frank, going once, going twice. I do have it. Um, I know we don't have a, and this might not be necessarily a planning board thing, but it stems from the work of the downtown vision committee. Um, we're not having a Christmas parade this year. <clears throat> But that doesn't mean we can't put a tree up out front. I see the public works have already gone around and put all the decorations on this, that, and the other. But we need to have public works put a tree in there. So and maybe we get a small hand group of Boy Scouts or something to decorate it. I don't want to miss a year. I'll be so there. Frank. I'll, Frank, I'll be there with you again this year. I, I'm there with you. And Dennis, Frank. let's call Dennis. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Jennifer. Frank, on behalf of a member of the Rec Commission, I can tell you that there is a Christmas tree going up. It was donated from a local farm here in Berwick. Um, it is in the works to um, be placed there this year. So no worries on that. I am very glad to hear that. And on, on another note, I do have one more thing for Frank. I'm gonna be sending you over an updated spreadsheet. Take a look at it and let me know what you think. Okay. Thank you very much. 
All right, anybody else? Okay, next on the agenda is the adjournment. The adjournment's next. I'll make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion by Jerry to adjourn. Second. Seconded by David. All in favor? Aye. Okay, thanks gentlemen Thank and you. ladies or lady. Have a good night. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>